following the tour of Her Majesty the Queen to Jamaica in 1953, her sister, Princess Margaret, visited the British West Indies in February of this year. This is the story of her tour through Trinidad and Tobago and of the islands themselves. Trinidad, with its peace-loving inhabitants, appeared like an oasis to the seafaring traveler Christopher Columbus in 1498. Trying to find a short route to the east by sailing west, Columbus, coming upon the land, was inspired by the three distinct mountain peaks to name the island La Trinity, Trinidad. Trinidad's capital city since 1774 is Port of Spain, a city with over 100,000 people, the cosmopolitan in race, and exciting in different shades of color. Well, Frederick Street is the local Broadway, the center of the hubbub, a name which quickly becomes familiar to the tourist calling here. Every visitor to these islands is impressed by the different races living harmoniously with each other. Fruits and vegetables are abundant. Bananas retain their tropic connotations, and tomatoes, well, tomatoes are the same everywhere. Crab and callaloo, a dish concocted from a combination of crab, okra, and dashing leaf, is one of the national dishes. Coconuts grow in great profusion in these sun-kissed islands. And they are a favorite first quencher with a native and visitor alike. Religion is an important feature in the lives of Trinidadians. There are many existing denominations, but here people live side by side with each other with the right to worship God as they please. And many of the schools are also denominational and are assisted financially by government grant. Getting away from the heat of the classroom, teachers sometimes take their charges into the schoolyard. This class is truly cosmopolitan, and the mixture of all or any of these races is gradually evolving into West Indian nationhood. Secondary schools in the island prepare students up to the standard of the higher school certificate examination. For those students who wish to take a profession, there is the University College of the West Indies in Jamaica. Port of Spain, a name which is a relic of the Spanish conquest of the island in the 15th century, is today a port of swift commerce. By marvelous industry, land was reclaimed from the sea, given the city a deep water harbor, which facilitates ease of trade. Ships of large tonnage can now be berthed alongside the wharf. From all parts of the world, they bring much needed equipment and supplies, to keep the wheels of the island's industry turning. But the ships not only bring cargo to Trinidad, they also take away. Here, sugar, one of the many items of export, is prepared for overseas markets. With tropic sunshine all the year round, there are only two seasons, the wet and the dry. In the dry season, cane harvesting operations begin and occupy a large percentage of the island's working population. As a tree of wealth, 
The sugar cane is perhaps second only to the coconut. From cane comes sugar, and from sugar, inevitably, rum, molasses, and wax. Bagasse is also now made from the crushed cane stalk, a basic raw material in the production of fiber board. Vital to the island's economy is its petroleum industry. Oil was first discovered late in the 19th century, but it was not until the British Navy in 1917 switched from coal to oil for its power did the industry begin large-scale development. natural resource accounts for nearly $166 million in the colony's export trade. A giant symbol of this great industry is the glittering face of the Point Pier refinery, which forms an impressive approach to the principal southern town, San Fernando. Another natural resource is one of nature's most amazing gifts to the island, the Pitch Lake. More than 150,000 tons of asphalt are removed annually, yet no visible impression is made on its surface. In his conquest to find El Dorado, the city of gold, Raleigh in 1595 accidentally discovered this wonderful lake. Round the clock, overhead conveyor trolleys take the processed asphalt to ships at the pier. Over 120,000 tons are exported every year. Asphalt has paved many byways and highways in countries throughout the world. But charity begins at home. And here, in preparation for Princess Margaret's visit to San Fernando, a number of streets on which she will travel are being resurfaced. And at strategic points in Port of Spain, several prominent trilons have been erected and are now being given the final touches with decorative flags and streamers. Welcome signs and red, white and blue decorations are painstakingly added. In the heart of the city, a new look has been given overnight to commercial Frederick Street. And night finds, standing against the silent sky, many important business houses, illumined like giant Christmas toys. In this colorful setting, the music of the steel band instruments of which are peculiar to Trinidad, drifts with nostalgia through the streets from the outskirts of the city. But the steel band needs the carnival spirit to be complete in its effect. Carnival is a national fate, and preparations for this year's celebrations begin a little earlier for a very special reason, a royal reason, that is. Participants take infinite care and often incur considerable expense in the designing and perfection of their costumes.
Princess Margaret's itinerary will not allow her time to witness this year's carnival celebrations. But the early preparations will enable her to get a preview at Government House, where some of the lavish costumes will be displayed in her honor. Here is a glimpse of what she will doubtless see. At last, the great day has arrived and breathless excitement fills the air as large crowds wait expectantly at Piaco Airport to welcome Her Royal Highness, the Princess Margaret, to Trinidad. People from all walks of life, people of different races and colors, all join happily together to give the princess a warm and friendly greeting. His Excellency the Governor, Sir Hubert Rance and Lady Rance, are symbols of the high respect and warm regard with which the peoples of Trinidad and Tobago hold the Princess Margaret and the whole royal family. A guard of honor comprised of members of the Trinidad Police Force are well rehearsed in the role they have to play in this drama of spectacle and color. And now, Her Royal Highness inspects the Guard of Honor.
On behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, Sir Hubert reads an address of welcome to the princess, in which he expresses the hope that a visit to these islands will be an auspicious start to a happy and memorable tour of the British West Indies. In her reply to the governor's welcome address, the princess remarks that she has been looking forward very much to the time when she should set foot in the British West Indies and that she is delighted to be now in Trinidad. Following her reply, leading figures in Trinidad, members of the Legislative Council and their wives, and other government officials are presented to her, as well as upon special invitation by the Trinidad government, two representatives and their wives of the Legislative Council of British Guiana. The first part of a welcome now completed, Her Royal Highness prepares to move on to the town of Arima. Here at the Arima race course, another warm reception is given her by the people of this former capital of the Caribs. The mayor of Arima, Councillor Raphael Chinaliong, on behalf of the people of his borough, delivers an address of welcome to the charming princess. Replying later, Her Royal Highness tells the people of Arima that this is the first town she has seen on her visit to the Caribbean, and the welcome given her is one she will never forget. Little Maureen Sabero, 13 years old, who presents to the royal guest a lovely bouquet of anthurium lilies, will doubtless remember this occasion for the rest of her life. Three rousing chairs end the last official function of a day filled with royal ceremony, pomp and splendor. After the last farewells, the princess prepares for a 18-mile drive through the eastern main road to Government House in Port of Spain, where she will reside while she stays in the colony. On the following day, as Princess Margaret leaves Government House for a state ride through the city, there is a sudden downpour of rain, drenching the entire town. Fortunately, she is happily protected by the Pullman car, chosen for just such an occasion. But the rain obviously did not dampen the gay, rejoicing holiday spirit of the thousands of people who lined the streets hours before, all anxious to see their beloved princess. With dignity and charming grace, Her Royal Highness acknowledges the tribute paid to her.
With the Catholic Cathedral in the background, a section of the crowd at Marine Square tries for another vantage point to get a second glimpse of their princess. of the escort vessel Bigbury Bay are sentinels in the rain. The princess continues her state drive through the city along the well-planned route, enabling thousands of city dwellers to see her. As the royal procession rounds the Cokery Junction into Western Main Road, the people unable to repress themselves any longer surge forward spontaneously. Suddenly, the warm sun breaks through to perfect a day of holiday rejoicing. Fifty thousand cheering people pack the grounds of the Princess Building, where Her Royal Highness, ending her state drive, is to attend a civic reception given in her honor by the Borough of Port of Spain. She is welcomed to this historic building by His Worship the Mayor, Councillor Packer Hutchinson, on behalf of the people of the city. And replying to the Mayor's welcome address, this is what the Princess has to say. I thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your kind address. It is a very rare pleasure to me to be making my first visit to Port of Spain, a city whose name conjures up visions of adventure, courage, and romance in every mind. But it is clear to me that its citizens are not content to rest upon the past. I see on every side the signs of enterprise and vitality. And I should like to congratulate all those for contriving so successfully to develop your city into one of the important seaports of the British Commonwealth. I thank you with all my heart for doing so much to make my visit so enjoyable. And I can assure you that the happy memory of it will remain with me all my life. It is an inspiration to see in the city and the whole colony how successfully leadership and understanding have combined to enable different races to live together in peace and prosperity in this island, owing a common allegiance to the Queen. I thank you once again, Mr. Mayor, for your generous hospitality. And I send through you my best wishes for success and an ever-increasing prosperity to all the people of Trinidad and its proud capital city, Port of Spain. After the formal speeches, a nice informal family atmosphere prevails. A Royal Highness and party with members of the Royal Household move along the balcony from where she waves time and time again to the crowds on the lawn. music of the steel band, specially invited by the city council to play on the grounds, the mayor presents aldermen, councillors and their wives, and other prominent figures of the council to the princess. Thank you. 
member of the Legislative Council and famous Calypsonian, the Honorable Raymond Quevedo, is favored with more than a few words with Her Royal Highness. The reception now over, Her Royal Highness and party prepare to leave. The Princess Building has made history as a site of state welcome to Princess Margaret. But it has an older history. It has been connected with royal visits since its erection in 1861. And the fascinating princess now takes her place in continuing the tradition of almost a hundred years. Rousing cheers spontaneously arise as the princess departs, bound once again for Government House. Born a princess, she has fulfilled her role magnificently, and the people of Port of Spain will take away with them vivid pictures of the attractive lady, wearing with such ease the mantle of royalty. Princess Margaret in the afternoon, following her state drive, visits the Queen's Park Oval, where 30,000 children from the northern part of the island rally together to welcome her. children of today, who will be the men and women of tomorrow, show that the spell of royalty can bind together people of different colors, races and creeds, all being a part of a larger family, the British Commonwealth of Nations. The Royal Highness of the Rally gives glimpses of the fun-loving and gay princess by which title she's often called. She loves children and is happy in their midst. Here she views a grand march past, headed by Boy Scouts, proudly carrying their banners. And so ends another day of colorful pageantry. Long will the children remember the wonderful feeling of working together as a team. But above all, they will never forget the dainty princess who was at once royal, yet human and lovable. Before visiting San Fernando, the principal southern town and the industrial capital of Trinidad, Her Royal Highness graciously accepts to open a section of the new road to the south, which is renamed the Princess Margaret Highway. Wherever she went, her warmth and sincerity captivated Trinidadians. With a pair of specially made silver scissors, Her Royal Highness cuts the white ribbon to formally declare the highway open. In a park is the scene of the South's demonstrations to the princess.
On the open cycle course, Her Royal Highness is warmly greeted by members of this 100-year-old borough council. The Mayor Councillor Gerard Montano, in a speech of welcome, reviews the tremendous stride San Fernando has taken in its development from a small fishing village to a flourishing township. And Princess Margaret, who had read a great deal on the background of these islands and of these towns and cities, is obviously greatly interested. In her reply, Her Royal Highness mentions that on her drive to San Fernando early in the day, she saw a little of the industries which were responsible for the prosperity of the town. And now a few members of voluntary organizations are presented to her. The princess, with her lady-in-waiting and the Minister of Education, reenact the scene of the Queen's Park Oval in Port of Spain as they mount the field car in which they will now drive through the ranks of children assembled from the south. Wild cheering and small union jacks fluttering in the breeze greet the princess. The cheering from 11,000 school children continues in never-ending waves. Her drive now completed, a little young lady will make a presentation to her on behalf of the people of San Fernando. the scene of riotous color, there are some who are not content with anything but a bird's eye view. The little girl with her boy scout friend, Escort, executes her task successfully of presenting the princess with a bouquet. She curtsies as only little girls can and makes a very good retreat. The memory of this day she will always treasure. And on behalf of the youth of the South, another scout. Robin Montano is no less successful. Her Royal Highness is obviously pleased with his gift to her, a fitting climax to this children's day in the South. Still fresh and radiant as ever, Her Royal Highness performs yet another important ceremony, the official opening of the new San Fernando Colonial Hospital. Patients of this great institution are also glad of this opportunity to see their princess. But this ribbon-cutting ceremony ends her program of appearances in Trinidad.
a complete success, Princess Margaret prepares to take leave of the island. By contrast with the rousing welcome accorded her and her arrival, a note of sadness looms over Piaco Airport, from where she will be flown to the sister island, Tobago. The vivacious personality of the young princess, certainly a worthy ambassadress from the mother country, has touched the hearts of the people who have gathered once again at the airport, this time to bid her farewell. This gay, high-spirited English girl possesses qualities which endear her to the people of this little island with their natural exuberance and love of life. No royal visitor has ever left these shores, ensuring by winning the hearts of its citizens stronger ties with the British realm. But any feelings of sadness at her departure from Trinidad were swept aside when she arrived at Crown Point Airport, Tobago, an hour later, after getting a bird's eye view of Crusoe's Island by making an aerial tour of the country. A welcome party headed by the Warden of Tobago, Mr. Ray Darby D, and the Honorable A.P.T. James, member of the Legislative Council representing Tobago, are there to meet her. A few minutes later, Her Royal Highness is driven along a truly tropical country road, fringed with waving coconut palm, which recalls scenes that may have inspired Defoe to place his novel in this unsophisticated setting. She arrives at the gaily decorated Shaw Park, where another children's rally awaits her. In the blazing forenoon sun, the dainty princess carries a parasol as she meets more people in the open park. Then, happily seated in the cool of the pavilion, Her Royal Highness listens to an address of welcome read by the Honourable Member for Tobago on behalf of his people. Mr. James then stresses the great joy that is theirs on the occasion of Her Royal Highness's visit and gives a few brief notes on the colourful and chequered history of this little island. The old and the new meet together as a shining, powerful royal car climbs the hill, taking the princess to the relic, Fort George. From the top of the fort, Her Royal Highness gets a splendid panoramic view of the countryside, with sprawling coconut plantations in the distance and the deep blue sea with white surf waves beyond. A visit to the old fort doubtless brings back for a few fleeting moments memories of days of cannon and shot and of proud men in glittering armor. But the commitments of everyday life have to be faced. So Her Royal Highness prepares to depart from this, this lovely setting of an ancient world to fulfill her last official engagement in Tobago. Here on the lawns of Government House, a garden party is given in her honor. And polite and interesting conversation is one of the prerogatives of royalty. This guest played cricket for the princess's grandfather. Her Royal Highness had previously expressed a desire to meet as many of the local people as possible. This she now does in her own inimitable way. And after she has met and talked with many of the guests, others also get a close view of her 
as she moves leisurely among them. Indeed, a princess amongst us. She is the most poised, the most elegant, and the most unselfconscious person I have ever seen, a lady guest remarked of the lovely princess. The most dignified and gracious person I have ever met fell from the lips of another. These compliments were but an echo of the remarks heard since she arrived in Trinidad four days earlier. Wherever she went, people were captured by her charm and the ease with which she made interesting conversation with them. The magic of her personality touched everyone who was privileged to meet her. And the thrill and memories of her visit to these islands, which have left an impression on all sections of the community, will remain lingering in our midst for a long time to come. And so ends this story of a visit signed with success. These two little colonies, the last of a long chain of green sunny islands, stretching from as far north as Florida and to South America in the south, and standing out from the Caribbean like precious jewels, have had their beauty enhanced by this royal visitor. To the youth of Trinidad and Tobago, this has been fantasy come true. Their dream world of beautiful fairy princesses has blossomed into reality. To the people of these islands, this has been a most memorable and important feature in their history. Yet another stepping stone which strengthens the ties between the members of this great commonwealth of nations. To the young princess, this has been a stirring adventure into a strange new world. At a time when her own country was embraced by a deep winter, she has, within a day, been transported into a world of sunshine and color and verdant tropic vegetation. And so we say, long live the beautiful princess. Long live the queen.